Good day, everyone. Welcome to this webinar on BS8536 2022. The title of this standard is, as you've seen there, Design, Construction, or Manufacture, Construction for Operability. I'm Brian Atkin, and I had the great pleasure to be the chair of the drafting panel. I'm also a member of the technical committee for facilities management and the strategy group. I serve also on the international committee for facility management. That probably takes account of half of my time. The other half I spend in project management with industry. And together, I think the approach that I invariably take is one of trying to consider the whole life cycle of projects. And indeed, this is really a fundamental theme behind the work that we've undertaken here in this latest revision of BS8536. So let's have a look at the panel. We can just have the webcams on and uh, we'll quickly uh, introduce them. Well, I've said a little bit, I've said enough about myself, I think, for now. Uh, after I have uh, gone into an overview of A536, I will pass over to Andrew Elliott, who is a consultant with the Nichols Group. Uh, and Andrew has been particularly involved in our work in the area of project management, uh, project management in relation to projects, programs and portfolio. And he will share with us some particular insights to these aspects. We'll then move over to uh, Michelle Aga Hossein, who is an expert in soft landings and in fact has been involved uh, heavily directly in leading this work uh, for about the last seven years nationally. We then have Alex Tate, who is Director of Practice at the RIBA, and uh, he will share his perspectives on the, uh, the view, if you like, from uh, the designers. And then lastly, we have Sarah Davidson, who has contributed in the area of building information modeling as part of information management. These are our experts in the panel. They were amongst 25 other individuals who spent a lot of time over the best part of two years in bringing BS8536 2022 to fruition. And uh, what uh, we are going to do now is move directly to my overview of uh, this latest revision to BS8536. So perhaps we can uh, just leave my webcam on for now as we go through this. So I've said a little bit about myself. Um, I do want to emphasize the importance of taking the, uh, the overall view of the life cycle of projects. Um, whilst you can see the affiliations there are related to uh, facilities management, we've got to actually deliver the facilities in the first place. But more about that as we go through. So, let me move on to the, uh, the first main slide where we need to make clear that this is a code of practice. As a code of practice, it makes recommendations what should be done. It provides supporting guidance all the way through to the successful steady state operation of assets. Now, we use the word asset to include buildings and infrastructure. This is a standard for all built assets. We particularly highlight briefing, and you'll see reasons for that in a few moments, as well as design, manufacture, and construction. This is, as you understand, a revision, and it's a revision of what was a, a, a two-part standard, 2015-2016, with an expanded scope. We have introduced in this standard, in this revision, the word manufacture. We had as a theme previously design and construction for operability, but we've added in manufacture because this is characteristic now of uh, how the industry is working. So let's take a closer look at uh, what we've got in terms of the uh, evolution, the timeline of BS8536. Well, it all started, in fact, in about 2008, 2009. It was the first standard that the 
technical committee for facilities management got to um, draft and uh, having been involved at the outset there I can relate to uh, a little bit of the background. I think the main prompt for this was that there was generally dissatisfaction with uh, a number of projects, wouldn't like to uh, say any more than that, where the expectations and indeed the requirements were not realised once the facility was handed over. So the focus is very much on briefing, how can we get operational needs and requirements into the design so that there are no unpleasant surprises when we get into operation use. We felt that that was a, a concept which was in need of elaboration. Indeed, in 2015, we expanded it to bring in much more of the um, activities and processes that are part of the delivery process for built assets. So 2015 saw a focus on um, embedding soft landings, BIM, aftercare, and post-occupancy evaluation. When we published that standard, it was not um, expected that we would then produce um, a companion for it the year later. Um, but I was pleased to say that we did then do just that. And having got a standard which was primarily for buildings, we then um, took, into the, uh, took the focus into uh, assets, um, particularly infrastructural assets. Uh, broadly speaking, the, the same approach, uh, but uh, obviously when it comes to uh, operational phase, uh, differences are uh, notably post-implementation reviews rather than uh, post-occupancy evaluation. Now onto the present, the, uh, the current revision has retained the focus on soft landings, BIM, aftercare, but we've replaced post-occupancy evaluation with building performance evaluation. Uh, this is because of the work that has been done over the last few years in that area. So in fact, uh, 8536 2022 uh, does draw heavily on the work that's being done um, in the area of building performance um, evaluation. We've also introduced more on project management uh, and topics which I'll explain a little bit more out about in a few moments. I seem to have lost control of the, uh, the movement on the screen. So the, these are the key changes that we have in this latest revision. First of all, we are aligned with the 19650 series of standards on information management, building information modeling, and also the PAS related work. Uh, specifically the uh, PAS 1192 part six. Soft landings has now been in industry for some years and there have been developments there and we've incorporated the different, the changes there in 8536. And uh, Michelle will be talking about that uh, subsequently. I've mentioned already about building performance evaluation and at the end of January, BS 40101 was published on building performance evaluation and it is a uh, normative reference in other words uh, we don't go into all the details in 8536 because we have 40101 as the um, reference uh, for all the uh, the detailed arrangements there we've done more about um, if you like a project managed approach to projects and uh, here we've uh, uh, introduce more uh, and, and further alignment with the work that's being done in uh, the project management area, not just projects as, as, as single uh, events, but programs and portfolios. And also we've taken a, a closer look and incorporated more on risk management. There is a management standard on risk management, which is uh, given there. Think we'll have to move the slides on uh, manually please. Just uh, a little statement here, uh, basically what we've we've done is build on the good work that was done in 2015 and 16. We've merged the standards 
we filled in gaps and we broadened the scope. But it is now one standard to cover the delivery of built assets, buildings or infrastructure. Next slide. Now, I've highlighted here four particular industry practices which we have elaborated uh, in the revision. Uh, worth just uh, spending a few moments on these. We've seen gradually the introduction of practices around opportunity shaping or opportunity framing. This is really making sure that uh, we are well and truly prepared for the journey, the journey being the delivery of operational assets. A concentration of effort at the front end is especially relevant here, so we've brought this in and elaborated on it. And in common with what we see in other industrial sectors, there is a big focus on requirements, requirements management and configuration management. So taken together there, they provide much more structure um, around ensuring that we, we capture needs, that we are able to uh, translate those into requirements and then maintain the integrity of the deliverables all the way through. That's where configuration management comes in. And you can see that particularly the points about uh, controlling change. Next slide, please. Uh, I, put, I put this in probably a little bit naughty me to, uh, to, to do so, but I, I felt I just had to, to share this with you. Uh, one of the, the early concerns we had when we started this, this journey with 8536 was the, the frustration with assets, with buildings and, and other facilities being delivered with problems. And it was a case very often that facility managers and asset managers would be heard to say, if only you'd asked me before you finalised the design, if only you'd asked me earlier, we could have saved on operational costs, energy costs included, and so forth. Uh, and that's something which I think is, is worth reminding ourselves about. Uh, delivering projects or delivering assets is, is exciting stuff, but they've got to perform as intended. And uh, sadly, um, sometimes they don't. And uh, we obviously through this work here, trying to address that problem. So making sure that we've got operational inputs in at the outset is, uh, is critical to successful delivery of operational assets. Next slide, please. Lots of things on here, lots of benefits. So I'm not going to go through all of this. I'll just uh, summarise what we see on here. But basically, as we can see there, for, for owners and operators, um, more predictability, uh, a, a process which is now defined and defined well enough to be able to follow, to be able to use as a baseline and then look at improvement and measure improvement against it. Uh, fewer surprises, hopefully no surprise, but at least fewer surprises when the asset is handed over. It uh, is achieving the required operational and functional performance. Costs in use, the operational cost can be considerable and uh, certainly uh, we need to be able to predict these with uh, some degree of confidence. And uh, again, it's all to do with no surprises once the assets are handed over. And information and data, uh, very important here, particularly getting the right information to the right people at the right time and in the right format. Now on the supply chain side, uh, more clarity certainly call for knowing who has to do what. And I will be clear about this, that um, the, the standard as a code of practice does not get into contractual matters. It's there to look at the roles, responsibilities, accountabilities, the information and data and so forth. But we don't muddy the water by getting into contracts. More of a balance between risk and reward, making sure that we utilize the expertise of the supply chain and that, um, as it says, last of all on there, more carrot, less stick. And on to the next slide, please. In common with all standards that are published nowadays, we, we have a duty to say how we are contributing to the 
UN Sustainable Development Goals. And in fact, uh, this um, revision of 8536 does contribute to eight out of 17 of them. Uh, in a way, it's hardly surprising given the nature of the scope of this standard. So um, I'm, I'm, I'm pleased that we are moving in the right direction and actually making a positive contribution there. So next slide, please. So my concluding remarks at this point, uh, just to underscore the point about we can apply um, this revision to all types of built asset. It's, a, it's scalable. So um, at 100 pages, it's quite a substantial document, but it is scalable and it does apply to all built assets and can be used by all kinds of organizations. Do you remember it's a code of practice? It sets out recommendations and guidance. It draws in requirements um, from uh, other standards and uh, uh, particularly in the area of uh, building information modeling uh, where we have the uh, 19650 of standards, uh, which are specifications and requirements. Um, I said already about um, other areas like soft landings and uh, building performance evaluation. Altogether, uh, these create this, uh, I would say, a, a blueprint for successful project uh, outcomes in terms of operational assets. And last of all, at this point, uh, we don't see 8536 as a standard for owners or operators, designers or constructors, or for that matter, asset managers or facility managers. It's one standard for everyone. So that's uh, all from me for now. If we move to the next slide and uh, we move on again, I'm just going to introduce uh, Andrew Owen. Thank you. Over to Thank you. you. Thank you. So as as Brian says, the the standard eight five three six reflects the thinking in the BS for project management six zero seven nine. Um, it's also very much aligned with the whole ISO family of related standards for portfolio program and project management. That's the two one five hundred series. Um, when we think about projects um, to work on individual assets. Um, it's important to think about the place of that asset, individual asset, in the system of which it's a part. Um, and really, when we do that and we think about investing in a in a project, there's a read across to the way that we think of projects as part of programs and portfolios, um, or indeed assets part of wider systems. So. I was going to talk through a, a slide, which I don't seem to have control of my slides. I have next slide, please. And I've now got control. So this 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 graphic is taken from the 21500 series of standards, and I was going to run through it um, in some detail to draw out the parallels. So an enterprise that owns and operates assets really does so to deliver benefits in line with its business plan. I mean, why, why else does an organization exist and bother investing in these things? So there's an operations box shown here. Intentionally, this is a sort of clunky Venn diagram. The operations expands into this area that sort of flows into this area that does projects. But in essence, the things that projects, programs, whatever deliver, the outcomes, fit, are used by operations to deliver benefits. And the benefits feed in with the strategy of objectives of the business. And in a steady state, the business just uses the assets it's got, doesn't do any projects to build new ones or maintain or um, repair them. It just it just maintains, operates um, in a sort of fairly non-project environment. But life isn't a steady state. It's never like that. Um, there's always the need to undertake projects to build or repurpose existing or new assets. And indeed, there's an emphasis in the standard now to think about um, you know, overall life cycle, repurposing existing rather than just demolishing and building new. But irrespective of that, the principle is that it's um, necessary to think about what the business is trying to achieve, what its strategy objectives are, the, the business um, plan for the business as a whole, the opportunities and threats before moving into thinking about doing work to individual um, assets. And the assets invariably are part of a wider system. And therefore, a, a project is more likely to be seen as successful if, if the asset 
a project to deliver the, the particular shiny new asset has been thought about in the context of the system which it's part of, and in turn, uh, in the context of the wider programme, which would look at multiple projects across the system, or indeed um, at a portfolio level, where you might have a number of systems. So a, 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 a water company, for example, could have um, a portfolio which had covered both the um, drinking water and foul water disposal side of the operation, and then have a programme that looked at fresh water in a particular area with projects for individual pumping stations, reservoirs, whatever. Um, so really whether whether a project is standalone or part of a program or portfolio, it needs to be thought about um, in the context of the system which it's a part of. So as it shows here that projects may or may not sit inside a program, may or may not sit inside a portfolio. Irrespective of that, they all relate to operations. The operations use whatever it is is created by these projects to deliver the benefits which are needed. So if we can get an alignment between that operational side and the organization that's doing the delivery and its structure of programs and portfolios, that can only help. Really though, whatever happens, one needs a sponsor within the organization that owns the business case Champions the project in the enterprise, particularly with the operator. I, I, as someone who's been on the delivery side of projects really most of my life, am far too often have seen a situation where the operator can always be an afterthought. Oh, and someone's got to use it, have they? Well, yes, obviously, and it would be helpful if the operator was involved in the early stages of briefing, something that Brian alluded to earlier. Um, so you need a, a sponsor who can work closely with the operator, ensure that the business really understands why it wants the project, give the requirements to the project manager or portfolio slash program manager, depending on the, the way the thing's set up, um, in order to be sure that the project really does deliver the thing the operator needs in order to deliver the benefits to the business. Um, it's really good practice before the design work commences to define how the finished asset will fit into the system of which it's a part and how it will be operated. So the, the V cycle is a good principle to follow here. You, you could sort of start at the end, think about the finished condition, the assets in use, how is it going to be used, what's the operator to do with it, then work backwards through how it's going to be brought into operation, how it's going to be commissioned, how it's going to be tested, how you're going to build it, to try to get the design to work in a way that makes the construction easy, building for manufacture rather than traditional, do it all on site. Work through all the front end thinking, the shaping of the opportunity, the clear specification of the requirements. So you can then work through the project the, the normal way from, from left to right to deliver it and hopefully um, land softly. And at that point, I will pass over to Michelle to talk about soft landings. Thank you. Thank you, Andrew. Good morning, all. As Andrew said, in this 10 minutes presentation, I'm going to talk a bit about soft landings itself and then how it relates to BS8536. Next slide, please. So uh, let's start with the definition of soft landings in a very lengthy sentence. Soft landing is a building delivery approach which runs through a project from inception to completion and beyond to ensure all decisions made during the project are based on achieving the project success criteria or targets and meeting um, the end user's needs and expectations. So in a nutshell, soft landing is an outcome-based approach for delivering well-performing buildings. In the cycle diagram on the right hand side of the slide, uh, you can see that soft landing process has got six phases. Each of these phases has uh, its own objectives. Next slide, please. Um, so let's look at some of these objectives uh, or activities uh, which are involved in uh, soft landings process. Involve FM and end users from the beginning and uh, throughout the project 
and also, uh, you know, during the initial aftercare. Um, as Brian said, um, maybe uh, the FM, they can't really do the design for the design team, but the information uh, that they can provide based on their experience can be very, very valuable to the design team. Uh, review past experience, as I said, uh, this is not just for FM, but also the client and the project delivery team. Uh, it's very important for them to look at their previous similar projects uh, and uh, review lessons learned uh, to uh, basically, you know, repeat what went really well in their uh, previous projects and avoid what didn't go very well. Uh, setting success criteria. Sorry. Could you go back to the previous slide, please? Yeah, thank you. Setting success criteria uh, at the beginning of the project, again, based on uh, clients' needs and expectations and the experience of the project team and the FM. Uh, it's uh, important not to make the list of success criteria very long, uh, maybe focusing on three or four um, um, you know, vital ones uh, to the clients. Uh, agree evaluation methods. So when you set the success criteria, you also need to think about, uh, um, you know, the methods that you are going to use to evaluate uh, those um, targets at the end. Uh, conducting reality checking workshops, really important throughout the project, especially during design and during construction, if value engineering is uh, happening during construction, uh, to make sure that the design solution uh, will support uh, the outcome uh, that uh, the client is um, expecting. Allocating sufficient time for commissioning and handover. This is a common problem in most projects that uh, the commissioning and hand handover phase gets really uh, squeezed. Um, and uh, soft landings requires that uh, sufficient time should be allocated. Uh, ensure FM training, again, is really important during the pre-handover phase that the FM gets uh, a comprehensive training uh, about the building services, control systems, and so on, so they can feel confident uh, in controlling and managing the building when the building is in operation. Uh, commit to aftercare and post-occupancy evaluation, uh, because obviously if you don't evaluate the performance of the building, you don't know whether you achieve the targets or not, and you don't know whether you have delivered a successful project or not. Capturing and disseminating lessons learned, uh, again, really important because um, uh, uh, you can use this uh, in your future projects, but also you can use this in order to optimize the performance of your current project. Uh, next slide, please. Um, so overall, these objectives and activities can be divided into three main groups. First, setting uh, project success criteria from the outset. Um, you need to understand the client's expectations uh, and the end user's um, needs. Involving FM at this phase is very important uh, as they can provide valuable information, as I said. Um, agree on evaluation methods uh, so you know what data you will need and when you need to um, measure the performance of the building. Uh, then protecting and promoting the success criteria throughout the project. How do you do that? Well, by adopting a design that satisfies uh, the set performance targets, uh, by making sure new joiners are aware of the success criteria and their soft landings related responsibilities, by ensuring that value engineering wouldn't compromise the agreed outcomes, uh, by again keeping FM involved uh, throughout the delivery process to ensure maintainability, manageability, usability, accessibility, and so on. Allocating enough time to commissioning, as I mentioned, um, and uh, keeping the aftercare team engaged with the project after um, practical completion for a period of time to deal with emerging issues, uh, fine tuning, and gathering occupant feedback. And finally, evaluate the performance, carrying out a thorough and systematic post-occupancy evaluation uh, to optimize the building's performance and also introduce interventions if needed. Next slide, please. Uh, so to support the industry uh, to adopt and implement soft landings in their projects, uh, we have got a number of guides uh, available. Um, the main one, I would say, is the Soft Landings Framework 2018 that explains the objectives of each phase and also suggests different activities. 
uh, but also success criteria for soft landing projects uh, is another good guide um, for clients uh, who are not very experienced uh, in soft landing projects. So it helps them to basically think about uh, targets and suitable success criteria that they can set for their projects. Uh, next one, please. Uh, BS8536 has been structured uh, based on soft landings process uh, to promote better collaboration throughout the project between the client, each delivery team and the operators team, especially in matters affecting uh, the operational performance um, of the building. Next slide, please. So who ultimately should manage the soft landing process? Uh, the answer is the soft landing champion. It should be nominated at the beginning of the project uh, and it uh, should be a person ideally from the client side. Uh, soft landing champions are both the fuel and the glue on a soft landing project. Um, I mean, the flu in that uh, they provide motive force to make sure soft landings is actually applied. Ideally, um, uh, they should be people who will be closely involved in the project. Uh, all the way through. Uh, again, FM perhaps is the best person, best candidate to act as a soft landing champion. Um, soft landing champions, uh, as I said, also act as a as the glue for procurement processes that tend to be very uh, fragmented um, and to keep the project teams together. Next slide, please. So this brings us to the end of this presentation. In summary, uh, we looked at how soft landings requires the FM to be involved from the beginning to completion and during aftercare. Uh, I explained why BS8536 is aligned with the soft landings framework, um, is to promote better collaboration between the uh, project team. And uh, I also highlighted the importance of having a soft landing champion uh, and uh, that the FM perhaps is the best candidate uh, to act as a soft landing champion um, in creating a collaborative project environment. Uh, next slide, please. So in closing, soft landing is an outcome based approach that uh, can support us to deliver well-performing assets. Thank you very much. Now I uh, would like to hand over to Alex. Thanks, Michelle. Um, I'm now going to talk us through the RBA plan of work and the connection that we've made with that and this standard. So firstly, um, I just wanted to talk a little bit about what we see a plan of work as being and, and why we have one. Um, if you go back long enough into our industry, we used to all do the same thing each time pretty much. And there were small variations, but we all knew what we were doing because it was broadly the same. Um, as we've uh, increased specialization and um, sophistication from clients, client bodies and government that we've started to do things differently. And about 60 years ago, of course, we're doing things more differently before that, but about 60 years ago, the RBA created um, uh, a, a handbook for architects to help them with kind of project management processes. And in that, we created um, a set of stages for projects to follow. Um, those stages were really designed to help architects take through their clients um, the, the processes of a, a construction project um, and to make sure that there's some kind of consistency. Um, but then as uh, our industry evolved further, the, that plan of work became primarily useful in helping shape the way we appoint and procure, appoint um, uh, consultants and procure buildings. Um, so looking at serious variations to that that process, and I think the the 2007 version of the plan of work was the last version with um, letter stages. And if you remember that, you you'd see the second page of it rather than the nice plain template it was a total mess of 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 stage moving for to match different procurement rules. So the most recent version. Um, the structure of that plan of work is based on this, the same, so the 2020 version, the, the stages are the same as those from 2013, which was broadly created to map to the um, industry's 
um, and our government's drive to, to uh, better embed BIM and, and information management processes. So um, what is and isn't the plan of work? So it, it, for us, the, the guidance that the RBA provides, it, it's general, uh, it's not contractual. It, it's not schedules of services for any one discipline. We've, we've really been careful in the most recent version to make sure that it's all about project team activities. And we have the same thing with 8536. We were really careful to not make anything too geared towards any one individual. We're all talking about the activities that need to happen and the information that needs to be um, created and disseminated by the end of each stage. Um, so we're we're kind of neutral, but we're pushing for the for the correct processes. Um, and likewise for procurement, we, we've made sure that we kind of extract procurement issues whilst maintaining a clear flow of stage activity. So information progresses pretty much linearly, linearly throughout each stage. Um, of course, the plan of work is um, uh, it maps well to the BIM framework. Um, and primarily, the most important part um, of that is that it, it needs to be used alongside uh, best practice and, and our British standards, including this. So. Um, here's the uh, the later version, so it's probably quite small for you to see, but this is the later version of the template for the RBA plan of work. Um, and you can download this pretty easily if you just Google RBA plan of work. Um, so I won't spend a lot of time on it, but I will show you how it maps. So, spoiler, um, the stages between 8536 and the RBA plan of work are the same. And we've been really careful to make sure that they maintain the same. Um, they they were um, previously in the, in the in the previous version, and what's exciting for us about 8536 is it's the primary standard that we like BSI to use when referring to stages and our work related stages, because it means that we have maintained that consistency between the RBA standard and all of British standards that refer to stage based activities. Um, we did some work to try and map the RBA plan of work to other international standards um, a couple of years ago. Um, and those that have broadly followed the, the RBA work, they tend to have now the same stages, pretty much. They, they've, I mean, partly this will be down to the, again, our BIM drive, um, but also, you know, we've been fairly influential as, a, as, a, as our, our country and the processes that we follow. Um, but you'll see here, those um, plans of work are used internationally that, that don't map quite so well to us. They often miss some quite significant areas. So there's there's sometimes no preparatory stages. So those those countries that, that don't have that kind of area, this is still trying to, the, the way they do things has been the way they do things. They've not come around to that realisation that we all have to do things slightly differently to suit our clients' needs. Um, so they've not embedded um, a kind of a movable processes. Um, so this is us trying to show our leadership as, a, as our kind of UK output, uh, making sure the British standards and, and the kind of guidance from the RBA all map up. Um, here's an example, and, and being the RBA, we're more about buildings than assets overall. Um, so we primarily look at, at the issues that buildings have to go through. But this is just to show that the stages are broadly um, uh, consequential, but not entirely. Um, so there's almost always some kind of overlap between stages four and five. So that's technical design and into construction, just because the construction processes start before we totally complete all design work. And that stage four could go very close to the end of stage five. So all information produced to enable construction counts as, as design activity, and therefore should be part of stage four rather than construction stage five and then and then of course when we hand over buildings um stage six we follow a rigorous handover process we're also using them um so again there's a, a strong overlap there and i wanted to make sure that, that was clear and, and easy to grasp um the the biggest changes that, that we're seeing as an industry at the moment are primarily around expertise and the huge breadth of those that are involved in projects now. Massive amounts of new um, issues, more detailed issues, 
um, so that teams need to be able to manage an incredible amount of information uh, and design work um, and advice um, through the, the three kind of major teams, so the design team, the client team and the construction team to make sure that we have successful outcomes. And to go with that, of course, we have a huge amount of information. So we've made sure through the RBA and, and this standard does the same, um, that we're really considering not just the, the processes followed now and the information that we can get hold of and use now, but perhaps might be more and more into the future. So, of course, we're seeing uh, increasing use of, uh, of new forms of, of data in the um, prior to design that influences design um, and can be used in, in analysis um, and design activity, but also will help us um, in the construction process itself to, to make us more efficient and safer. And then on to um, uh, handover and use uh, again. So the 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 golden thread um, uh, as to be soon to be legislated for a higher risk buildings um, is another form of that um, solid information about building safety that we're able to gather and maintain. And this is another one of those. So th this is the kind of future of, of the way we see information management uh, and, and the use of this standard is a key part of that. Um, I've also got then more of a tongue in, tongue in cheek slide here about what the next standard the next version of this might look like and andrew's already gone into a lot of detail about the program and project management processes and perhaps there's the the next phase might be picking up organizational value um uh, into this standard um similarly to the way the construction innovation hubs value toolkit works if you've seen that if not it's what happened um you know we, we definitely see more uh, data-driven decision-making um, and that will perhaps change some of the processes in this standard in the future. Um, we may even see the end of 2D in the design process, um, increasing use of, of virtual reality and um, 3D modeling and so on and so forth. Um, obviously we're already seeing increase off-site manufacturing and, and we don't expect that to die down anytime soon. Um, and then most importantly, something that we don't have in this standard, but would like to see perhaps next is the introduction of the um, perhaps even a new stage, maybe the RBA needs a new stage for, uh, for end of life. So assets end of life. At the moment, we treat um, the decision to, to uh, alter a, a building or an asset through because of its it's reached the end of its useful life as as kicking off a new project a new stage zero but perhaps there's something in an end of life decision making um, to to better reflect um, reuse and, and circularity and that's it from me so I'm going to hand over to Sarah who's going to take us through uh, how um, A536 maps to the UK BIM framework. Thank you very much, Alex. Um... Okay, thank you very much. So uh, Brian introduced me right at the very beginning. I'm going to be talking today about um, the relationship between the UK BIM framework and BS8536. And I've been a co-editor and co-author of the guidance that forms part of the, UNI uh, the UK BIM framework about ISO 19650. So that sort of gives me a degree of insight to be able to do that. So let me move forward on my slides. Okay, so I think the first thing to, the first question to answer is, well, what do we mean by BIM? Because we've been using this term um, for as long as I can remember, going back maybe to 2011 and the construction strategy. That was certainly for me when I heard about it, but maybe you have been using it more uh, even before then. We can, it means different things to different people. and what I wanted to do was to start this discussion off with a clear statement about what it means in terms of ISO 19650 and the UK BIM framework and BS8536. When we talk about BIM, we're talking about the uh, collection of information over the life cycle of an asset and that information will be generated 
throughout a project and it will also continue to be generated as the asset operates and as Alex just mentioned there at end of life it will be generated at end of life as well. So when we talk about them what we really mean is um, the, the, the managed exchange of information no matter how that information is presented, whether it's presented in a geometrical format or through um, data or through associated information such as certificates or communications or schedules or specifications, whatever. When we, 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 when we talk about BIM, we mean that managed exchange of information to support design, construction, operation and end of life. And we've got a great um, definition of BIM that has been um, presented in Transforming Infrastructure Performance, uh, the TIP Roadmap to 2030, which you may be familiar with. And that says that what we're trying to do is to generate, visualize, visualize exchange, assure, and subsequently use and reuse data and information to form a trustworthy foundation for decision making to the benefit of all those involved in any part of the assets life cycle. And in order to make sure that we are generating this information and using it robustly, we need to have standards in place that um, really set out good practice for us to follow. We need to have processes um, that support the implementation of those standards. Um, so, for for example, to, to to guide us on how to define information requirements, um, how to plan for information delivery. Um, we need to have technology to help us to generate, manipulate, interrogate, store and share information as easily as possible. So that's BIM and, and what is the UK BIM framework? Well, you can get to the UK BIM framework at www.ukbimframework.org. And it's a website that provides the access route to the standards and it provides guidance and resources to help us to understand the processes and to um, and how to get the best out of technology so that we can manage information throughout the asset lifecycle. And the UK BIM framework, it was an initiative that was supported by um, the BSI and the UK BIM Alliance and the Centre for Digital Built Britain. And as we move forward, it'll continue to be maintained and supported by BSI and the UK BIM Alliance and we're bringing various partners into the UK BIM framework as well. Now importantly the UK BIM framework it was it was mentioned um, on a number of times in the construction playbook that was published in 2020 but it's actually mandated through the information management mandate that is explained in uh, TIP 2030. So if you're a public sector organisation that um, is procuring through the uh, primary public bodies, uh, then the UK BIM framework is likely to be of relevance to you. The standards within the UK BIM framework cover the BS85, uh, the, B, the ISO 19650 series, and we've got parts one, two, and that should say three for operation and five for security. Now, the, the 19650 series builds on the PAS and BS 1192 Part 4 series that I think first started life in around 2007. So you might be familiar with some of those PAS standards or all of them, or you might have already transitioned over to the 19650 series of standards. Now, we've still got BS 1192 Part 4, which covers information exchange, and PAS 1192 Part 6, which covers health and safety. And BS 1192 Part 4 will be uh, superseded by ISO 19650 Part 4 later this year, and PAS 1192 Part 6 will take the form of an ISO over the, over the coming years. Now, in the UK BIM framework as well, we also have BS8536. We had the superseded versions and now we've got the, the current version. That is part of the UK BIM framework. And then it's not the UK BIM framework isn't static. And so we continue to review standards um, to, to consider whether they should become part of the UK BIM framework. Uh, and that's 
they're, they're important decisions to be made, particularly as the UK BIM framework is mandated. So it's not static and it's worth going to the um, website to just make sure to keep up to date with the standards within it. There's um, The standards uh, will tell us what we need to do, but they're not great at telling us how we need to do something and therefore guidance is really important. And we know with the development of PAS 1192 Part 2 and Part 3, there was a huge amount of guidance that was developed from many different perspectives. Um, most of it was um, complementary, although there were conflicts that did exist. Um, what we've tried to do through the UK BIM framework is develop a guidance series that is coordinated, um, that is easy to access uh, and search, and that can evolve. And so when you go onto the website, you'll see that there is a link to guidance. And it's set out in the structure that's on screen now. So we have guidance around the concepts, which is very high level. We then have specific guidance around ISO 19650 Part 2, which is about the delivery phase of assets, and also about guidance Part 3, which is the operational phase. We will develop guidance for ISO 19650 Part 4 when it's released. And we will look at guidance for ISO 19650 Part 5, which is about a security-minded approach, although I would say that there is already a lot of guidance available on the CPNI website, who are authors of 19650 Part 5. We then got guidance parts A, B, C, D, E and F, and those guidance parts pick up on common themes that run throughout the different um, that parts one and part two. So information management requirements, for example, planning for information delivery. So the guidance is free to access and I would really encourage you uh, to visit the website to see that. Uh, we've also got uh, other helpful resources in the UK BIM framework and, and perhaps the two most prominent resources are the information protocols that can now be used to support the delivery phase of assets, so ISO 19650 Part 2, and uh, the information protocol to support ISO 19650 Part 3, the operational phase. Uh, they are the only two uh, protocols that have been um, that have been authored and fully support the implementation of the ISO 19650 series. We've also got other resources such as an information management assignment matrix. We've got lots of information requirements, examples and various process maps uh, and so on. So that's about the UK BIM framework. So I'd like to move on now to explore BS8536 and information management. So when BS8536 was launched uh, in 2015, we did have some of the PAS standards available to us at that time. But this, this new version of BS8536 is uh, fully aligned with the ISO 19650 series and uh, PAS 1192 Part 6 and BS8536 uh, as well. Now that alignment is a key development from the previous version. And it's a core element of the integrated processes and delivery team that BS8536 speaks of. In clause 4.5.2, we can see reference to a unified process of design, manufacture, construction and operation to be adopted for the project and supported by an adequately resourced integrated project team. And apologies if you can hear a lot of noise in the background, apologies about that. In clause 4.4.5 of BS8536, we can see reference to this evidence-based approach and how setting out um, performance requirements from the outset and then calling for evidence against those performance outcomes throughout design and construction is likely to result in improvements to the expected benefits and the achievement of more exacting operational requirements. A core element of alignment is in the terminology that's used to describe the parties and teams that are involved in the design, manufacture and construction process. And I am just going to talk about that, um, just in case it, it isn't something that you've seen before. So when we look in BS 8536, um, and when we look in ISO 19650 part 
too. Um, we see this figure on screen here, which is showing you um, the relationship between different parties. And so the big uh, all-encompassing circle that's showing us the project team. So that's everybody involved in design construction. And then we have these sort of mini teams that are created, and these are called individual uh, delivery teams. Now, the definition of a delivery team is somebody that's appointed by a client and all their uh, subconsultants, sub uh, sub um, contractors that they will need to appoint so if we were to look at this diagram and to think about a typical construction project then we might have a delivery team that is our uh, delivery of architectural services we might have our delivery team that's delivery of engineering services our delivery team that's delivery of construction through the contractor and we could have delivery teams that are through the delivery of cost management services um, project management services and so on. So this term, the, the parties are termed as party A, who is our client, would be a lead appoint, would be an appointing party, sorry. And every party that they appoint directly is referred to as a lead appointed party. And I've mentioned delivery teams and I've mentioned project teams as well. Now, this is important. Um, it's important to remember that this terminology is for information management purposes only. So this doesn't um, doesn't take away um, the activities of anybody that might be in a lead design role, lead contractor role or anything like that. This is just in terms of information management. And these different teams are described in clause 4.2 of uh, BS 8536. And you'll see that the references to appointing party, lead appointed party, appointed party, task team, delivery team, project team are um, throughout BS 8536. Now, Brian, when he um, spoke earlier, he mentioned about the benefits of the implementation of BS 8536 for different parties. And he talked about generating um, predictability. So predictable processes, predictable outcomes. He talked about having a framework um, so that there could be that increased predictability. And he talked about having improved data and information processes. And he also talked about having clarity over roles and there being a balance between risk and reward. So I just want to explore briefly how um, information management sort of enables this predictability, the framework he mentioned, the clarity, and the risk and the gathering of evidence. So the image that you can see on screen here is figure four from BS8536. And what it's showing is, is that we, we start at the very beginning with the definition of our required outcomes or as our success um, criteria that Michelle mentioned as well. And as we go through either the operation of an asset or the design and construction of an asset, we're going to build up an information model that is going to offer evidence against those required outcomes. And that information model, when we build it up through a project, we refer to it as a project information model. And when we build it up through operation, we refer to it as an asset uh, information model. So that's the information that's supporting those required outcomes. And that information makes sure that we um, we get the evidence so that we make sure that the required outcomes remain on track. Um, and, and if we can see that through design and construction, we're departing from the required outcomes, then we've got the opportunity to put in some remedial measures to make sure that we do get back on track. And then what we can do once we once we've evidence that those outcomes can be achieved, then we can uh, start to measure the impact during operation. So really what we're doing through the development of our information models is creating the information um, that would support those reality checking works workshops that Michelle mentioned when she was talking about soft landings. So the processes of eight, 
eight, uh, of, of um, 19650 are built around requiring information, planning for its uh, production, generating it, sharing it, and, uh, and delivering it. So the first thing really is that information has to be required. People need to know what they're obligated to provide, and information has to be um, generated for a purpose. So that might be because we want to evidence success criteria. It might be because we've got a regulatory requirement to um, to provide evidence uh, and there was just an example there that maybe we want to understand how our heating uh, is going to be modeled throughout the building and can we actually afford that so information requirements um, have to be specific to the parties that are involved in design and construction or a project activity that carries on in operation so we have our information requirements so our information deliverables are specified through um, information exchange requirements and alongside that specification is standards about the information processes about um, how the information should be generated and shared and then we have a contractual obligation that is put in place through the um, uh, information protocol so that's the requiring aspect of ISO 19650 and then we've got the planning for uh, information delivery now each party that is appointed should plan for information delivery because the chances are that if you're doing a task you're going to generate some information and that planning um, requires consideration of the program of the competency to develop the information to work with the technologies and there also needs to be the high level oversight so that information um, planning is coordinated now a high that information delivery planning can start off quite high level and it would definitely be high level through the tender response process um, but it's anticipated that it will get more granular as um, an appointment becomes more concrete. And then we've got the activity of information being generated. Um, so information should be generated to, to meet that plan for information to delivery and to make sure that the information requirements are being met. Uh, the information is going to need to be shared within the team for various reasons such as for coordination, if it's design information, for comment, um, for review. And then if it's information that is to be delivered to an operator or an operations team or a client because it has it's there as a means of generating evidence, uh, informing those success criteria, then the information should be authorised before it's shared back uh, with that client for acceptance. And only really once the information has been accepted uh, and formally exchanged, should it then be used for its intended purpose? And that accepted information, that becomes the information model. So this process of information requirements, planning, uh, generation, and then authorization and acceptance that creates that evidence approach based approach that is at the front and center of bs8536 it also offers um the commonality uh, and and the predictability of the processes um, that Brian mentioned and the processes are transparent and they can be used at any point in the assets life cycle so although we do focus quite significantly on design and construction there will be asset management activities being carried out throughout the operational life and there will be new projects whether they're mini projects or major refurbishment projects or extension projects throughout an asset's life and this process of information requirements planning authorization acceptance can be implemented throughout um, the process and the prescription of precise information requirements generates clarity about information obligations and um, this then creates the mechanism to generate reliable evidence so that we can understand planned uh, and predicted versus actual performance and that evidence and that information is built up and tested over time and it means that we can understand 
the extent to which we're meeting success criteria and it also means that we can understand risk around information production. So just to finish off then, information is a form of deliverable. We very often focus on tasks, but the information generated from those tasks is as important as the task itself. Um, and it'll be it'll be generated regardless of the project type, so whether it's a complex project or its scope, whether it's a new builder refurbishment or whatever. Um, information is generally required to enable objectives to be met and for decisions to be made. And arguably, if it's not supporting those things, then is there a point in generating the information in the first place? Objectives and decisions do need to be accurately, accurately recorded and communicated in the first place to make sure that the information can be, the requirements can be articulated effectively. Progress against objectives needs to be monitored so that action to retain them can be taken as and when needed, the earlier the better of course, and evidence that objectives have been catered for needs to be recorded along with the parameters that form the basis of those objectives. So it's all very well um, calculating uh, or, or having required indoor operating temperatures, but of course that's got to be balanced against the um, environment and the conditions. Um, but with that evidence in place then, operation against objectives can be measured. And again, in op operation, actions can be taken to ensure alignment of actual versus plan for. And if all the evidence has been generated throughout design and construction, and the evidence says, yes, we are, it looks like we're on track to meet the performance requirements or the successful criteria, then if there is departure in operation, it's likely that that departure is around how a building is being used um, and that can be remedied through uh, training and education of the unis, users. And then information management is absolutely fundamental and the UK BIM framework offers those information uh, based processes that we need to follow. And at that point I'm going to say thank you very much and hand you back to Brian. Thank you very much, Sarah. Um, super. Um, right, thank you to all our speakers for their contribution so far. If we could have everyone's webcam on, all the uh, speakers, then we will get into our Q&A session. We've got lots of questions. What I would like to say first off is we don't get through answering them all. We will answer them after today. Um, we will put together the answers so that everyone who has put a question to us will get uh, an answer. Uh, perhaps I could just start off by picking up uh, a, a point which really came uh, out uh, latterly with uh, Sarah's presentation. Um, does 8536 address information requirements or does it lock us back into the documents? Um, it, it did cover all of this in, in great detail, but I think the, the concern is that um, we've got we've got 8536 in front of us now, and and it's covering not just BIM but other things as well. But you know, how much can we rely on 8536 to help us with understanding information requirements? So 8536 does explain about the different types of information requirements and also indicates the relationship between the information requirements um, and it and it provides us lots of examples of around plain language questions that are going to inform information requirements what so you could in theory develop information requirements from bs8536 what 19650 does is it gives the more detailed processes around how information requirements fit into appointments how you develop them um, with the support of information standards information production methods and procedures how you have the protocol in place and then how you evaluate uh, or, or review respond to those requirements as a party that's going to be delivering information and how you accept and authorise. So I suppose if we answer the question in black and white, it doesn't, 8536 doesn't lock you into 19650 to understand how to author information requirements and, and indeed the guidance that's on the UK BIM framework is all freely available and there's lots of guidance on uh, different types of information requirements. But if we want to understand how they fit into the bigger picture, then it's, we need to go back to 19650. Great, thank you. I think that's very, very clear. Can we just ask you a supplemental question? Um, 
plain language questions what happened to them so they they do still exist in in IC, uh, bs8536 and you know at the heart of 8536 and iso 19650 is this idea that we've we've got uh, we've got success criteria and we've got to have an, a decision points, and it's really helpful to understand decision points if we can turn that around into questions that we need to be asked. So, can we afford this building? Is it going to be delivered on time? Is it going to um, it, it, are, are, is it going to um, operate efficiently? All of those questions, all of those decision points perhaps feel more logical as plain language questions. And BS8536 does still refer to plain language questions, does provide examples of plain language questions throughout, and they're really informing success by criteria and decision points. Okay, thank you very much. I think we'll let you off the hook for now. Thank uh, you. Now we've, we've got a question where I suspect it's, it's probably a combination of um, Alex and Andrew to, uh, to deal with this one. So let's let's just pick up this point. Um, we 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 saw in um, the presentation, Alex's presentation, the uh, the waterfall approach. So that uh, rather linear um, life cycle. Um, but we know that increasingly projects are utilising uh, other forms, hybrid forms. So um, the qu question is basically around the extent to which um, you know, we we are catering for um, something other than the uh, the waterfall or linear life cycle. What about um, agile? Is 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 that got a place? Uh, are we catering for it? I think I could say something on that, but I'd rather hear first of all from um, perhaps um, who would like to go, Alex or Andrew. Who's going to go first? I'll, go on, I'll Alex. jump in first. Um, yeah. Absolutely, yeah. I think um, agile. Um, kind of project management methodologies do fit both within the plan of work and the um, A536. Um, I think, and and upfront, I think is what we're we're really talking about here. We're talking about the the beginnings of projects. Actually, ideally, we're talking about pr prior to projects uh, and helping make sure that clients have access to all the right expertise. To make sure that they're setting up the idea of their programs and then their projects effectively um, first. So, I mean, the way we see it is, you know, we do need the the kind of generalists who are able to see all of the different issues and help corral them into one beast. So, I think the question talks about the the releasing the potential of pluralism, uh, which I think is a great question. Um, and, you know, we, we do need people to be able to work in their approach, their discipline, without that negatively affecting everybody else. So we have kind of project managers and we have client representatives and, and kind of key leadership roles within the different teams. And their jobs are becoming increasingly difficult because they're having to be broad as well as deep. So I think in the, in the in the past, if you were kind of lead designer, you were going to meet with the, your kind of client and their representatives to talk through, you know, some concept design issues. You'll find that they're now bringing all of their um, specialist teams in them into the same meeting. So instead of covering off one area, you, you're able you you need to be able to engage at really deep deep levels. So I think we're already into the kind of the the pluralistic world of project management. Um, and the way we see the stages working is they're all iterative in the first place. So they're not quite so much of a do this, do this, do this. They're more like a do this, do this, do this. And then we may also need to go back, of course, to we didn't I didn't put that in our, my little nice basic Gantt chart. But of course, if we don't meet the need, the end requirements of the stage, we're going to have to make sure we do that there. You know, we are clear in the, in the plan of work guidance that you have to get to the end of the stage before you start the next one um, apart from where there is some of those kind of key overlaps which is why that diagram was important that that they are and i, I use the word consequential that they're, they're consecutive but they are you have to finish one before you move to the other 
but that doesn't mean you have to finish it all fast. So I think we, we definitely have the ability for, for agile processes. So we complete small elements, move on to the next as quickly as possible. Okay. Um, and, okay. well, I, I would just sort of add to that really to say that thinking about the, the context of a project sitting in a, a portfolio world program, um, you can chunk your projects up as, as, as small as you want. And some projects will have an extremely short delivery period um, and may deliver it wrong the first time. You know, better, better, better done now. You know, better, better do something to your water system now so it carries water even if it's not perfect and come back to it, which is sort of analogous to a, an, an agile approach of do a, do a quick first activity, get something that's good enough, come back, improve it. Now, that can be hugely wasteful and result in lots of rework. But equally well controlled and as part of a bigger program framework it can be just the right way to get a particular thing done so whilst i agree with alex that you can't um shouldn't start one stage in the riba uh, plan of work before you've finished a, an essential pre predecessor that gets you the right information if you've chunked the thing down small enough you can be very agile in how you bring forward some elements of the program very quickly I'll just jump in again, just really quickly, just to say that, of course, the, 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 in the design process, we can use, you know, we can, we can use our really detailed modeling processes to, to test those ideas uh, and play with them and see them fail before we implement them in reality as well. So you can do, you can do both of those approaches. Okay. I can, can I just add one? Can I just add one point about that? Because Andrew, you mentioned about getting information. And I just thought it might be helpful to say that when we when we talk about the information generation, exchange, authorization, acceptance process, that is that is per appointment. So these information-based processes are running and running round and round and round and round and round throughout the whole project um, anyway. So just to make a point about that. Thank you all for that. Now, um, Michelle, we have one for you. Uh, we did hear a lot about soft landings. We hear about it a lot in general, but um, how how does one get started with it? It's a very, very pragmatic um, view on this. How does someone get started? Can you help them? <laughs> sure. Okay. Um... Yes, yeah, so as, as you uh, correctly mentioned, soft landings has been around for about eight years now. And uh, in the last maybe four or five years, we can actually see that uh, soft landings is required in many tender documents, which is great. Uh, however, in many tender documents, you can see that the requirement is really vague. So they just say follow soft landings process. Uh, so my recommendation is for, for the clients, especially, because obviously this is a process that should be driven by the clients um, to basically um, better try to better understand uh, the process and what exactly they want uh, in terms of soft landing activities in their projects um, and uh, try to be a bit more clear about their requirements in their tender documents. Uh, there are so many guides, publications available that they can help um, the, uh, the clients and also project delivery teams. Uh, as I mentioned, the Soft Landings Framework 2018 is a great source uh, and been actually uh, referenced in BS8536 in so many places. And it's also great to see that uh, 8536 is structured based on the soft landings process. Uh, this uh, definitely will help to raise awareness about soft landings. Um, and get in touch if uh, anyone has got any question uh, about soft landings. I'm more than happy to to help out. Okay. All right. Well, thank thank you very much. We've got um, a couple of questions which I I can probably just deal with directly. Um, this one is related to examples of operational plans and operation budgets. Um, perhaps the the short answer to that one is that eight five three six doesn't get into the operational phase quite so much what once we if you like once we've got into a steady state of operation through periods of aftercare then really the guidance on operational matters operational plans budgets and so on is to be found elsewhere so just generally for information certainly on the facilities management side 
we have standards uh, relating to these aspects, which will be covered principally, uh, but not exclusively, by a BS 8210 on um, facility maintenance management and uh, 8572, if I remember correctly, on procurement. Uh, we, we've got um, the question about uh, the golden thread of information. A uh, bit of a tricky one, this, because um, it, 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 um, it does take us into that um, territory of, uh, of legislation. And I just want to say one thing in general, that standards don't comment on the law. The law is a law, but clearly we're working in an industry where certainly when we think about safety, um, it's, it's very much uh, relevant. I can say that in the case of 8536 that we do uh, highlight the um, golden thread of information and do point um, users of the standard uh, in the right direction. Um, there are um, three passes on the way which are dealing broadly with uh, principal designer, principal contractor and managing building safety. Uh, th they should be published in the coming months and, and, and they obviously take on um, this aspect uh, rather more. There's also the FLEX uh, 8670 BSI FLEX which is freely downloadable from um, uh, BSI which will, will help there. But as we all understand, the Building Safety Act only uh, came into uh, being last week. Uh, we, we've seen um, the bill go through Parliament and changes, not least of all the withdrawal of the requirement for building safety manager. But anyway, I'm going off the point somewhat, but uh, we, we do acknowledge the, um, the relevance of the golden thread of information. Uh, but we also have to think that uh, uh, mostly were in the domain of higher risk residential buildings and our standard is trying to cater broadly for all built assets which leads me on to one final point before i come back to something on on that answer um around the golden thread um a parallel piece of work's been being carried out to create a built environment specific version of iso 9001 which will be BS 99001, uh, should be published in the next month or so. Um, and that really does try to bring together the, the quality, as it were, of the documentation side of the project that's being delivered, as well as the physical thing, uh, to ensure that all the records are there as to why the physical thing is as it is. Um, and that's um, some of that's alluded to in um, 8536, but that separate standard is one it's worth being aware of. Okay, th thank you for that supplemental. Now we've uh, just got another question in here. I've still got a few more we could, uh, we've got a bit of time. Um, yes, uh, there's a question here about digital twins. Is someone brave enough to uh, to get into that then? Who's going to, uh, well, the particular um, uh, question here um, is, um, well, it's due with budget, but uh, AI, artificial intelligence and uh, uh, trying to encourage these different approaches. I suppose it really comes down to, I think this is aimed at Alex really and the things that you were saying before when you were tentatively suggesting what um, we might be seeing in the future in terms of standards and the scope. And I'm, I'm very grateful for your opening up that one. So uh, could you say a little bit more on, on this about um, how, uh, and perhaps Sarah might also want to come in as well on the, the digital twin side. I'll stop talking at that point. Yeah, I'll, I'll, I'll start off. I'm sure Sarah has much more expertise in the area than I, than I do. You know, we, we, we certainly see a, a change in the information requirements, the types of information and, and the formats that, that those will, will come in and the way uh, design teams, client teams and the construction team will work with that, those, that form of information. So, of course, the, the national digital twin approach to, to kind of modeling industry um, uh, real time uh, and, and potentially buildings real time should have a big impact, certainly in the way we can um, undertake facilities management more effectively, but also the design process. You know, we see the, the concept of, of really thorough 
modeled, so complete assets modeled and running, helping a, a massively in the design process. We, we do that in some form already, and we've been doing it for a while, but but in much more basic sense. We're not we're not running the you know a model of the grid through buildings or anything. We're just testing out um shading and so on but we're now starting to get into a world where we can really start to have you know realistic assets operating in the digital world um, and that will definitely change the way we can we can model and make design decisions in the future um, and perhaps it'll start with the bigger pictures up front so um you know the the increasing use of kind of parametric modeling for for, facil for um, uh, feasibility studies, so setting like basic parameters and then running processes through AI um, vehicles overnight or over the weekend and coming back with hundreds of thousands, if not millions, of options that that could fit the client's requirements onto a site, um, but might identify alternative sites, um, all sorts of other things. You know the, the way uh, our industry is, is going to be affected by that is, is just incredibly exciting and and hopefully there's um, places for all of us and and our members across the industry to to be part of that um but this probably changes in what it is to be a professional to come in with it too i'll, I'll pass over to sarah to see if you want to pick up so i think the term digital twin it's not dissimilar to the term bim in that we but often use it to talk about very different things um, my, my focus is always on the data, really, rather than how that might be represented. And I think that we need to not to hold any uh, progress up because it shouldn't and hopefully it won't. But I think that we need to become really good at understanding our data and information requirements and articulating them because we waste a huge amount of time developing stuff that just isn't needed is informing no particular purpose and i think that if we can if we can become if, if we can start off thinking about how our building is going to operate we can translate that into data and information requirements then we can really look at how we can use technology to generate and and I'm talking about data and information because at the minute I think what we produce is information. Uh, but what we want to move is to more to, is towards the production of data. Uh, and when we produce structured data, then that gives us the ability through technology to look at how that's presented through visualizations and so on. So I think that um, this focus on di on data, whether you refer to it as digital twinning, however you refer to it, is really important to motivate the industry forward. But we we have got to get competent at defining requirements and, and uh, using what we get back. Thank you very much. Well, thank you very much, all of you. I think we're just about out of time. I hope uh, those of you who did ask the questions feel that you've got uh, appropriate answers. As I said before, we will respond to all of them in the coming days. I would like to thank our expert speakers today uh, for their contribution, but also to acknowledge all of the others who were part of this journey that represented a cross-section of the industry. They should not be forgotten because there was a lot of effort put into this. And uh, one aspect of that just quickly was alignment of terminology. We did feel that was an important aspect to, to work through. I'd also like to thank uh, BSI's editorial project manager, Kevin Laverty, who was the, um, person behind the scenes that kept everything running smoothly. Uh, thank you, Kevin, from, from all of us. And lastly, we've got some details on the screen now to which I can add that there is an executive briefing document which will be available through BSI um, shortly on uh, 8536 um, 2022. Um, it's um, going to take you more into it is obviously not going to substitute for getting hold of the standard itself you can see the details of that and the uh, the discount if you uh, purchase it by the 5th of uh, June um, so uh, on that note uh, I will thank you all very much for your attendance today and I do hope you've got something valuable out of it and uh, I look forward to um, BS8536 2027 because it's on a five-year review cycle have a good and safe day all of you thank you now bye-bye